The Battle of Honshut took place during the Flanders Campaign of the Campaign of 1793 in the French Revolutionary Wars. It was fought during operations surrounding the Siege of Dunkirk between 6 and 8 September 1793 at Honshut, Nord, France, and resulted in a French victory under General Jean-Nicolas Huchard and General Jean-Baptiste Jordan against the command of Marshal Freytag, part of the Anglo-Hanoverian Corps of the Duke of York. Background By August 1793, the coalition army under command of the Austrian Prince of Coburg had taken Condé, Valenciennes, and Le Coteau in northern France. The Allies planned to next besiege Cambrai, however the British government ordered the Duke of York's Anglo-Hanoverian Corps to instead seize the coastal port of Dunkirk, the possession of which they believed would be a valuable military base and bargaining counter. Its defences, manned by 8,000 men under the command of Joseph Suham, were thought to be in a poor state of repair and vulnerable to capture. York concentrated at Menon and split his command in two forces, 22,000 British troops he led directly to invest the city of Dunkirk, while the 14,500-man covering army of Marshal Freytag consisting of the Hanoverian troops and ten squadrons of British cavalry had to protect his left flank. The Duke of York drove Suham's men back into Dunkirk, taking the Rosendale suburb on 24 August then digging in to besiege Dunkirk from the east side. The siege looked as though it might be a protracted affair, as York had neither siege artillery nor the manpower to properly surround the city. Arriving at Poperinge on 20 August, Hessian troops under Freytag's command drove the French from Ostkapel and Rexpady back to Bergs. This fortified town was, two days later, surrounded by a corps moving south of Bergs and taking Wormhout and Esquelbeck. The corps was then spread in a thin military cordon. Its left lay at Poperinge, its right at Houtkirke. Freytag's command was split into a number of small outposts in the occupied villages. Freytag was an experienced commander and had seen much service in the Seven Years' War commanding light troops, however at Honshut his trust in the cordon system of linked army outposts was to prove fatal. The new French commander of the Armée du Nord was Jean-Nicolas Huchard, a brave and experienced subordinate general but patently out of his depth as commander-in-chief. Formerly one of Custine's closest deputies, he was in his element leading the charge of a cavalry regiment, but had neither the acumen or confidence to head an army the size of the Armée du Nord. Custine had prophesied that the command of an army would be an evil present to him. Custine certainly could judge men, and he was right in this case, for all who knew the worthy old Huchard considered him as lost when given a charge so much beyond his powers. Paris was in the grip of the reign of terror, hanging over him was the spectre of suspicion, Custine himself was under arrest for failing in the field and would shortly die on the scaffold. Placed between the zealous harangues of the representant N missions and the inadequate condition of the ragtag troops he commanded Huchard was acutely aware that the leadership of the Nord could be a fatal command, and his confidence both in himself and his subordinates was greatly undermined. Huchard wrote on taking command My life is poisoned. Everywhere calumny has preceded me, everywhere I have suffered the last agony, since I have found nothing but distrust in all the persons who do not know me." Nevertheless, following the levée en masse the troops under his command were being rapidly reinforced with new recruits. Lazare Carnot, newly elected to the Committee of Public Safety, had galvanized the command structure and had ordered a rapid concentration of forces south of Freytag's position. By 24 August, 20,000 men were in Castle Entrenched Camp, 4,000 at Lille, and between 12 and 15,000 more were en route from the Moselle Front. The Anglo-Hanoverians were aware that the French were strengthening their front and asked for reinforcements from Coburg, but the Austrians were tied down with the siege of Le Canoy. The only concessions made were for a corps under Beaulieu to be moved up to Bouvines and Orkies, while the lackluster Dutch troops of the Prince of Orange spread out between Lannoy to Menon. On 27 August Huchard launched 15,000 men in three columns against Orange and Beaulieu's forces towards Torcoing and Menon. MacDonald's column was beaten back from Lannoy, and the same fate befell the command of Dumas at Lincelles. At Torcoing, faced by Huchard's central column the Dutch abandoned the village after a stiff fight, but the French then dispersed to plunder, only to flee on the sight of two small bodies of enemy cavalry. 
Huchard had intended to threaten Menon, a determined attack through here would almost certainly have cut off the entire British corps, but confusion reigned in the French camp. Huchard lost seven guns as he fell back due to his civilian artillery drivers cutting their traces, and the opportunity was missed. <laughs> Battle of 6 September Having realized that York's objective was to besiege Dunkirk, Huchard saw his opportunity to drive a wedge between the Anglo-Hanoverians and the Austrians. However he had no intention of massing troops to strike a decisive blow, Huchard merely planned to use the concentrated forces at Castle to demonstrate against York and draw him away from Dunkirk. At the beginning of September Huchard learned of the execution of Custine in Paris, which sent him into a spiral of dejection and allowed the representatives virtually a free hand. On the fifth reinforcements from the Rhine raised his forces at Castle to 45,800 men. On the same day Freitag, fearful of the French build-up to his front, sent two detachments to seize Arnick, which was duly stormed, though a British colonel was taken prisoner. Huchard was probably aware that an enveloping attack against York's communications would be the most effective strategy, but under pressure from the representatives, it was resolved instead to launch a direct attack on Freytag's thin line, spread out in detachments south of Dunkirk. On 6 September Huchard's forces were poised in eight commands. On the right Dumini men was at Bailul. To his northwest lay Vendam 4, while Edouval 7, lay at Steenvorda. Next was Jordan's corps of 13,000 at the castle camp. Slightly north of there on Castle Hill stood Landron 6, Considerably further to the north Bergs was held by Leclerc with 6,000 men, and finally the Dunkirk garrison were to commit 6,000 in support. In total Huchard utilized some 51,000 men against York's 35,000 across an 18-mile front. At daybreak on the 6th, 30,000 Republicans erupted from these positions. Edouville drove the defenders from Poperinge, while on his right Vendam advanced with little resistance to Proven. They then took Raubrug, crossed the Yser and halted at Ostkapel. On the left flank Landron came up against severe resistance at Wormhote. Further still to the left Leclerc 6, advanced from Bergs but was forced back by Freytag's right wing under Walmoden. In the centre Collard's brigade from Edouville's column drove the defenders from Houtkirke, where he was soon joined by Huchard with Jordan's division. Huchard had planned to join Edouville via Rausbrugge then march with both columns on Hondschut, however on the insistence of his staff officer Ernouf he abandoned this plan and instead turned west for Herzeel, sending Colo to Proven. Jordan led the assault on Herzeel, which was quickly taken, and, encouraged by this success, Huchard then advanced across the Yser and capture Bambeck. Freytag's men withstood the assault bravely despite being vastly outnumbered and the fighting became very protracted. Those facing Huchard and Jordan behind the Yser held out at Bambeck all day, helped by a violent rainstorm. As French ammunition began to run low Jordan wrote to Huchard to ask if they should halt, to which the chief of staff Berthelmy responded, We must conquer at any price, failing cartridges, are there not bayonets? Eventually at 6 p.m. Bernadotte's regiment managed to ford the river and the Hanoverians withdrew from Bambeck. With his men exhausted and knowing Edouville's column had also crossed the river at Ostkapel Huchard wished to halt for the night, but Representative Hence overruled him, announcing, Free men were never too tired to fight the slaves of tyrants, therefore the army should continue its movement. On they pushed to Rexpady, which was seized by Jordan with three battalions and a regiment of cavalry. At eight. 00 p.m. Freitag ordered a retreat to Hanshut, sending orders for Walmoden's command facing Bergs to join him there. Freitag led his men along the route via Rexpady, unaware that the town had already fallen to the French, and the head of the column ran straight into the French outposts. After a confused scuffle Freitag was wounded and captured, together with the future Duke of Cambridge. The latter soon escaped, thanks to the help of his young aide-de-camp Scharnhorst, but Freitag remained a prisoner in French hands until Walmaden, who had suspected his commander could be in danger, arrived with his column at Rexpady and retook the town, scattering Jordan's three battalions and almost capturing Huchard in turn. The panic was so severe that some of the French, including Bernadotte's battalion, ran all the way back to Kassel. Walmaden then took command of the whole corps and fell back to Hanshut, arriving there by 6 a.m. on the 7th. He stationed his left on the village of Lazel, his center in front of the town, and his right on the Bergs Canal. 
His front was covered by a mass of hedges and ditches, the only passage was over a dike leading into the town of Honshut, however despite being a great defensive position it denied the Hanoverians the use of their cavalry, in which they greatly outclassed the French. Walmaden urgently requested reinforcements from York, but due to the flooding of the fields around Dunkirk the only way troops could be sent was via Bergs. Attack of 8 September The next day Huchard attempted to renew the assault, but Jordan's troops in particular were scattered and demoralized after the hard fighting, so his forces were pulled back to the south bank of the YSER to reorganize and resupply. However to his left Leclerc advanced once more from Bergs and met with Edouville's column advancing from Ost Capel. As night fell their commands lay at Rexpady and Maison Blanche respectively. Behind them Landron was at Wormhout, west of Huchard's own command at Herzeel. Further north Vendam with his 4,400 men left Proven and advanced on Honshut via Raubrug and Ost Capel, only to be driven back to towards Killam by Walmoden. As 8 September dawned the situation lay as, Walmoden was at Honshut with 13,000 men, faced by the three largely fresh columns of Vendam, Leclerc and Edouville, 17,800 in total. Behind them lay the spent remnants of Jordan and Huchard's columns, some 13,000 strong, together with 6,000 fresh troops of Landron. Further away at Bailul lay 9,000 men under Dumini. Thus Huchard's command was again spread out over a wide front. Huchard decided to launch a three-pronged assault on Honshut. On the French left Leclerc's column was to attack Honshut from the direction of Maison Blanche along the canal and the inundation. In the centre Huchard personally led the main attack with Jordan's division from Rexpady flanked on its left by Vendam from Killam and on the right Collard's brigade detached from Edouville's command, in total a column of 20 battalions directly along the dike covered by artillery. Edouville was directed to move northwest to Bergs then turn eastward to join the battle at Honshut. Landrine's column was sent to Dunkirk to help pin down the Duke of York. So, of his entire 43,000 men Huchard only utilized some 22,000 for the attack on Walmaden, while another 12,000 were sent to Dunkirk, and Dumini's 9,000 men were left facing Ypres, far from the seat of action. This scattering of his forces was a mistake that displayed Huchard's shortcomings as a commander, had he instead concentrated his attack against the Hanoverian left at Lazel rather than placed his main weight in the center then Walmaden would inevitably have been forced to withdraw to protect his line of retreat. Nevertheless, tactics were on the side of the Republicans. The broken ground before Honshut was perfectly suited to the French use of loose skirmishers. Jordan and Vandamme's men kept up a constant fire from the protection of the hedges, which the Hanoverians had little answer to. After four hours of determined combat, however, with the fighting at such close range, the opposing troops were within stabbing distance. The French in the centre were making no headway and were slowly being forced back. With the center wavering Huchard rode out to bring up Collard's brigade on the right, ordering Jordan to attack again when he heard the charge sounded. As the French line began crumbling Jordan brought forward his one remaining reserve battalion, hoping to use it as an anchor to lead an attack. Jordan was slightly wounded in the chest, but at last Huchard's signal was heard and the attack went forwards. On the right Huchard led the charge at the head of the 17th Cavalry. Having lost a third of their number, with their left seriously threatened by Hadouville and ammunition running short the Hanoverians were finally forced out of the town. Having fought against incredible odds and endured heavy losses Walmaden withdrew in two disordered columns to Ferns, covered by a Hessian battalion and his cavalry which prevented any French pursuit. <laughs> <laughs> Allied retreat With news of his left flank exposed the Duke of York gave orders for his heavy baggage to be withdrawn to Ferns, while at a council of war it was decided to lift the siege of Dunkirk. Suham had rendered the canal unusable for transport, so the heavy siege guns had to be abandoned. At midnight of the 8th York's corps began withdrawing to the coastal city of Ferns now Vern in Flanders Belgium, where the next day he rejoined the rest of Walmoden's troops. There was no pursuit by Huchard, so York was able to extricate his command without interference from the French. Part of the reason was that the French were in complete confusion by the end of the action, however Edouville's troops, who had been reconnoitering towards Bergs and taken no part in the action were available. Edouville was in fact sent in pursuit, but he halted when he came to a broken bridge. 
Van Damme was given three cavalry regiments to cross a marsh and pursue York, some baggage was captured but nothing else. Walmaden had lost 2,331 officers and men from his 9,000 infantry over the past few days fighting, including the Hessian general Kochenhausen, who was captured and later died of his wounds. Gemini suggests the French loss was about the same, but eyewitness Gay de Vernon estimates it as 1,800. At Honshut, 30,000 French had defeated 14,500 Hessian and Hanoverian soldiers, capturing six flags and, as a consequence of the subsequent retreat, the Duke of York's 32 requisitioned naval siege guns. Despite his triumph, however, Huchard was seen unsympathetically by the representatives. Not only were they witnesses to his hesitations, he refused to throw his tired and disorganized men at York's orderly rearguard, telling the representative bluntly he was not a military. This was to prove fatal, for his failure to pursue York and stumbling command Huchard was later arrested on charges of cowardice, tried and guillotined. <laughs> <laughs> Assessment Alfred Byrne devotes several pages assessing the siege of Dunkirk and Honshut, including York's report, in which he made plain he felt Freitag was culpable. York writes of Freitag. On 6 September, the day of the first attack upon the field marshal's corps, he never would believe that the enemy had forced the post on his left flank in spite of repeated reports that were sent to him, nor was it till six in the evening, that he consented to retreat, which he did in two columns. Instead however of sending the artillery and baggage with General Count Walmoden's column which was furthest from the enemy, he chose to take them in the rear of his own column. On the conduct of the Anglo-Hanoverian force Byrne challenges Fortescue's summary on several issues, pointing out that Fortescue did not have access to York's correspondence when he wrote his history. In particular he criticizes Fortescue's assertion that Freitag should have taken position at Honshut from the beginning rather than the more advanced line, for reasons that Honshut was too narrow a front, too close to ferns, the position lacked depth, it would have cut communication with York, and the terrain was unsuitable for cavalry. In my opinion Freitag occupied the best possible position, his mistake was that he was forgetful of the principle of maintenance of the objective, namely, to cover the besieging army, till pulled up sharply and rightly by the Duke. 